This morning, we are kicking off a new preaching series. And this preaching series really comes out of several years of work that we've been doing across the Grace family of churches. We realized a couple years ago that as the family has grown and we've planted churches out of Grace Snellville at Midtown and then Athens and Monroe and Marietta and New Hope and Capital City, that we need to figure out what it is that makes grace, grace. And so we all got together and we told stories and we remembered and we talked and really this is what we came up with. We are a growing family of churches who share roots, relationships, and resources that fuel our vision to see our neighborhoods, nations, and the next generation follow Jesus. But who are we? What makes us, us? For more than 30 years, our communities have walked in the space between the Word and our everyday life, learning what it means to be God's people on mission together. We are worshipers, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are learners, hearing God's Word and doing what He says. We are family, loving one another in grace. We are citizens in the kingdom of God, establishing the way of heaven on earth. We are disciple makers, committed to raising up the next generation. We are neighbors, living intentionally and honorably with those around us. We are pioneers, adventurously going with God to the nations. We are dreamers, seeing the invisible, hearing the inaudible, and expecting the impossible. We are Grace. Yeah. Yeah, and so, um, at the beginning of this year, we knew it marked the one year anniversary of the passing of our founding leader, Buddy Hoffman. And as campus pastors, as lead pastors of the churches, we were talking and we said, we really want to do some stuff this year that helps root that family identity together. And so things like what we're doing in Pentecost at Monroe today, part of that, but also this upcoming preaching series is really an intentional step in that direction. And so what we've done is divided out those various identity statements among the preachers from the various churches. And we are going to, through the course of the summer, sort of like old school circuit riders, carry that message from church to church church. So in the coming weeks, you will be hearing from some of the other preachers in the Grace family speaking on those identity statements. I think it's going to be really powerful. It's going to be biblical. It's going to be grace. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I personally am very excited because the statement that I've got is, I think, the best. <laughs> we are pioneers, adventurously going with God to the nations. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1. And if you don't have a Bible, you can slip up your hand. We'll put a Bible in your hand. Also, if you didn't get one of those sheets for notes, you can get that with a hand in the air. Down at the bottom is a connection card with space for prayer requests and other communication that you'd like to give us as a staff if you need to reach out. All you do is fill it out, tear it off, and then drop that connection card in the offering plate as it goes by after the sermon. Now, while you're turning to Hebrews 12, verse 1, I want you to think about a question. Who is your favorite pioneer? Who is your favorite pioneer? We are pioneers. Who's your favorite pioneer? Uh, maybe you think of someone like Neil Armstrong, the first human being to walk on the moon. Or maybe you think of Jackie Robinson, who broke the color barrier with Major League Baseball in 1947. 
Maybe you think of Amelia Earhart, the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Maybe when you think of the word pioneer, you think about technology. And so you think of someone like Steve Jobs, who spearheaded innovation to the max, which is actually kind of a clever thing, funny thing, if you spell max, M-A-C-S, instead of M-A-X. See that? It's like Macintoshes. Some jokes work better in print. (laughs) Who's your favorite pioneer? Maybe you think of Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea going all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. Or perhaps the word pioneer triggers another adventure of westward movement. Something like this, Oregon Trail. Any Oregon Trail? players growing up, you had to be born at a certain moment in history to really love this game. Apparently this player was sort of like me, went out hunting frequently and is carrying 1,440 pounds of food in the wagon. As long as they survive the diseases, they're going to make it with that much food. Uh, Maybe your favorite pioneer is the pioneer woman herself, Ree Drummond. Uh, whose recipes explore the extremes of using butter. (laughs) But whether it's space travel or sports, aviation or innovation, or caulking the wagon to float across the flooded Missouri River, the word pioneer, it it just evokes something powerful within us. It's, It's something of exploration, of new frontiers, crossing boundaries. It's catching that breath of mountain air and feeling the electric exhilaration confirming that you are fully alive. I want to tell you about another pioneer who may in fact end up being your favorite after all. Hebrews 12 verse 1 and I'm reading out of the New International Version. Usually I read from the ESV but this morning We're doing NIV. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, we're picking up pretty late in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, but a little context. This book of the Bible was written, we believe, to some of the early Jewish followers of Christ who were living in the Roman world and they were experiencing all kinds of opposition, persecution, and hardship as they were following Jesus. And it seems that they were thinking about departing from Christ and going back to their old ways of life. And so the book of Hebrews, the big message, is that the way of Jesus is better than any other way. And if you have read Hebrews before, you remember how it starts off saying Jesus is better than the words of the Old Testament prophets. He's better than angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. He's better than the sacrificial system. He's better than the priesthood and all of its rituals. All of those other things, they have value, but they're incomplete. Don't go back to them because they were preparation. They were foreshadowing for the true and better fullness of Jesus. And because of this, the big point of Hebrews is keep following Jesus. He is worth it. Your faith will pay off. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep your eyes on Jesus, that pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And so when we at Grace say we are pioneers, we don't say that because we are adrenaline junkies. And we don't say that because we just want new stuff. 
We are pioneers because we follow Jesus, who is the great pioneer. And that word here in Hebrews 12, 2 is very rich in the original language. Some people translate it as founder or source or author. And it's got all these rich meanings associated with it. One scholar says this, given that word's full range of meaning, pioneer, the word designates an individual who opened the way into a new area for others to follow, founded the city in which they dwelt, gave his name to the community, fought its battles and secured the victory, and then remained as the leader, ruler, hero of his people. Pioneer, that's a lot crammed into one word. But just think about the life of Jesus as we have it in the Gospels. Think about his pioneering activity, that he came from heaven to earth, born as a baby in Bethlehem. That is a journey even more intrepid than walking the Oregon Trail. And then, in his life, he crossed boundary after boundary. He touched the forbidden lepers in order to heal them. He welcomed the sinners and the outcasts into homes where people otherwise would not have welcomed them. He upended any unrighteous legalism that failed to reflect the heart of God. Jesus intentionally went from his Jewish community into non-Jewish communities. And he shared life with folks from all sorts of different ethnic backgrounds. Of course, he went to the cross, perhaps his greatest act of pioneering, going through that frontier of death and out the other side in resurrection. And so when it says that Jesus is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, it means that he blazed a trail for God's rule and reign, for his kingdom to call forth and establish this new redeemed humanity whose home is the heavenly city and whose ruler is the risen Christ. And if, as it says in Hebrews 1, Jesus is the exact representation of God's nature, then we realize the pioneering activity of Jesus is in fact an attribute of God himself. The God is a pioneer. The act of creating a cosmos on God's part is a pioneering Act, bringing a new world into existence. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the garden, he pursued them. Where are you? When he called Abraham to go to the land that he would show him and be a blessing to all the families of the earth. When he liberated the Israelites from Egypt, when he desired Israel to make his name known to all the nations, when he called Jonah to go preach to the people in Nineveh, this is God's pioneering heart. And it won't stop in the new heavens and the new earth. It won't stop in eternity. If this is an attribute of who God is, then for all eternity... He will be generating new stuff, creating, sending us on fresh adventures, handing us new jobs and tasks and work to do in the joy of total redemption. So if this is the nature of God, we need to learn what it means to be with him in his pioneering adventurously going with God to the nations. But I also realize that as soon as we start talking about pioneering and new stuff, not everyone feels the same thrill of excitement. I remember, I've been in this sort of preaching role here at Grace Neville for about four and a half years. Before that, I was the mission pastor for about seven years doing what Kamal is now doing. 
And as we worked with the Grace family of churches to help people get mobilized into a short-term trip to, say, Kosovo, or to go down to Clarkston and volunteer, or maybe even to pick up and move the whole life of their family to another place or another country, some kind of pioneering work, not everyone loved it. A lot of people were not sure they wanted to go there. And even some people said, no, I'm kind of digging in my heels. Now, statistically, that makes a lot of sense. I don't know how familiar you are with that test, the Myers-Briggs, you know, that you take. It's introverts, extroverts, intuitive, sensing, judging, perceiving, all these different words. You get your letters, you know, and then you tell your letters to someone else so they can understand you perfectly. And life is wonderful, right? But that second category, intuitive versus sensing, really talks about the way people perceive the world. Uh, People who are intuitive from the test, apparently, prefer the forward, the future, what's imaginative, what's out there, that adventure. They're always coming up with new ideas and what could be and what's possible. People who are S's or sensors prefer where they are, what's around them that they can touch and feel, that they really know where they've been. That's their sort of base comfort with the world around them. Now, statistically, of all the people who take that test, about three of every every four people is a sensor, which means about three of every four people prefers kind of what's known. And that idea and call to pioneer can feel very uncomfortable if you're a sensor kind of person or a similar kind of statistical study. When they look at the diffusion of innovation through a population, so like new technology, the iPhone or HD TVs or the VCR. You know, how do these new technology things in history work as they diffuse through a population? And what they've found is that there are innovators, that's like two and a half percent of the population, and then there are early adopters, which are about 13 and a half percent of the population. So 16% of people, when they see something new, latch onto it. 84%, the majority of people, kind of have a wait and see attitude. Let's see if VHS or beta is going to win out. And so, when we're reading this passage, and it says that Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the word for some of you, pioneer, that word pioneer may not awaken something Uh, exciting. It may awaken something that you don't love as much. Maybe you gravitate more toward the word perfecter. You know, he's the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He develops, settles in, roots in, leads us toward our goal in a particular place. And in the course of this series, there may be some of these identity statements that resonate more deeply with you, like we are citizens or we are neighbors, or we are family. But even if you are not one of those people who's chomping at the bit to get to the frontier, you still have to remember, if Jesus is a pioneer and we're following Jesus, then we should expect that he will lead us into new spaces that he will lead us into new opportunities, that, that following Jesus will challenge us with change. So whether you are stoked or you're circumspect about being a pioneer, here's the question we need to answer. How do we follow Jesus in this aspect of his character? How do we follow him if he is the great pioneer? So we've got three practical things to unpack. There's the perspective of a pioneer, there's the path of a pioneer, and there's the posture of a pioneer. Now, the perspective of a pioneer, we get a sense of it in that verse one that we just read. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So this call to be a pioneer and follow Jesus, the great pioneer, is a call 
to run the race marked out for us. Now, in a general sense, all of us who follow Jesus, all of us who trust that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection welcomes us into oneness with God and releases forgiveness for our sins and calls us to a life of righteousness, all of us together, we're running sort of this big general race. And in a messed up world, simply living righteously is by nature pioneering. We're going against the current. But in addition to that big general sense, the race marked out for us has a specific call to it. That, that there is a race for us, a race for you and me that has been marked out uniquely and takes into consideration the combination of life and circumstance, opportunity and gifting that only you possess, that only I possess, that only this community possesses. That this idea of the race marked out for us is not just a general broad thing, but something specific. And that idea draws on the idea of the cloud of witnesses. It says, because we're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses, who is the author of Hebrews referring to? Well, back in chapter 11, we find this amazing chapter about the heroes from the old covenant, like Abel and Enoch and Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, who all lived by faith. And what we see there is that all of those great heroes of the old covenant lived unique stories, that they each had their own specific race to run, that Noah was called to do something pioneering, but it was a different kind of pioneering to build the ark than it was to walk in a land that you don't really know, like Abraham and Sarah, waiting on the promised child. All these heroes of the Old Testament, they all had this general sense of living by faith, but each had a specific calling. And that applies today as well. I remember that a few years ago, our Jesus and the Quran training team, which if you've never been to a JAQ, Jesus and the Quran, is this weekend training to help equip followers of Jesus to share their faith biblically and effectively with their Muslim friends. And we got invited to go do some trainings with house church communities in China. And these house church communities were primarily made up of Han Chinese, kind of the majority group of Chinese who are following Jesus in China. But we learned that in China, there's another group of Chinese who are ethnically the same as the Han, except they are Muslim. And they are called throughout China, the Hui. So you've got the Han and the Hui. The unique race For the Han Chinese followers of Jesus, part of what God was calling them to was to relate well to the Hui, who are a minority and actually treated pretty poorly in China. Now that is a unique race to them. I doubt there are a whole lot of us in this room who are Han Chinese called to reach Hui people, right? So that's their race. But what's our race? What's your race? One of the beautiful things about living in Gwinnett County is that we are living in this incredibly diverse community where we have folks from all parts of the globe. There's not really a majority ethnicity here in Gwinnett. Maybe part of our race to run as followers of Jesus in this county is learning to live with dignity and respect in a multi-ethnic, multi-racial community, both out and about and also here as worshipers and followers of Jesus. Maybe that's part of the unique race that the Lord has set before us. So the real question in the perspective of a pioneer, what's your frontier? As you're following Jesus the pioneer, what frontiers is he leading you toward? One of the ways to help discern and figure that out is to revisit some of the stories of the great pioneers of our Christian tradition. 
And so you might think of some famous folks who have gone on great pioneering adventures with God. You've got Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, who are pretty well known in most evangelical circles. We can pull up the slide of the Elliots, and you might remember that Jim Elliot, along with four of his companions, were speared uh, at the river in the Amazon basin, trying to share the good news of Jesus with the Rawarani people. Um, His wife, Elizabeth, and then the wife of Nate Saint, one of the other guys who got speared, Rachel, after their husbands were killed, actually went back into that tribe, learned the language, and saw a huge revival break out among those peoples and some of the surrounding peoples. Other pioneers, Lottie Moon, if you grew up Baptist, you might remember the Lottie Moon offering around Christmas time. Lottie Moon actually went to China to serve there, did a bunch of stuff in education, was an incredible pioneer and advocate for the leadership of women, specifically single women, within the work of God in the church. David Livingstone, I don't know if you know him, pretty well known, one of the famous missionaries, grew up in Scotland, was born to a working class family. Uh, At the age of 10, he started working 12 hour shifts at the cotton mill but was able to pursue an education in Scotland, eventually became a doctor, had a heart for work overseas outside of Britain, and so ended up in Africa. And he's known as a great explorer who pioneered all sorts of different maps and routes through the Zambezi River and all these other areas of Central Africa. The interesting thing about David Livingstone, his goal was to map out the heart of undiscovered Africa, undiscovered to the West, at least, in order to establish trade routes, legitimate commerce that would upend and supplant the existing slave trade. His idea was the only way to get rid of the slave trade in Africa is to eliminate the market by providing a better, healthy market. So that was his goal. He ended up dying of disease in Africa But then there are some other pioneers of the faith that maybe are not so familiar. Lot Carey was born in the United States as a slave, was able to purchase his freedom and the freedom of his two children for $850. He became a pastor in Richmond, Virginia of a pretty interesting church community where they had uh, multi-ethnic gatherings, ended up in West Africa, pioneering work there among many of his generational forebears. Other folks like David Brainerd, he was kicked out of Yale for being too passionate about God, ended up trying to engage and serve the Native American communities, especially in Delaware. He died young of sickness. Pandita Ramabai, maybe you guys have heard of her. She was a Sanskrit scholar in India, working among high caste Hindu women. She had an inter-caste marriage, which was pretty pioneering, and she came to follow Jesus, translated the Bible into her tribal language, her native language, from the original Greek and Hebrew, and was this incredible advocate for education and against child marriage, which was very, very common in India at the time, and pretty bad situation. She is so well respected in India, as you can see now, she's honored throughout the country. Incredible pioneer. Or or Ramon Lul, one of the first folks who really took witnessing to the Muslim community seriously. He's a Spaniard known as the father of the Catalan language, and he had a real heart for the Muslim community who had occupied that Iberian Peninsula. Uh, the, the Spain had been overrun by, Span- uh, by uh, Arab North African Muslims, and his heart was to go and engage them and tell them about Jesus. So here we have all these stories of pioneers that help inspire us what it means to follow this Jesus who is the great pioneer. But these stories, frankly, are pretty exotic. I mean, they're pretty far out there. Are you really gonna get in a canoe and explore undiscovered rivers in Africa? Maybe, some of you will, but many of us will not. And that's where we have to recognize that for some, the race marked out is rather exotic. 
And for others of us, the frontier following Jesus is right here in our everyday life. Like maybe the frontier to cross, the undiscovered country that we need to pursue is loving that person in our family who is really difficult to love. Or maybe the frontier is not so much then and there, but here and now. Maybe inviting a neighbor from a different ethnic background to your home to eat dinner with your family. Or maybe that frontier is pursuing a career path that has always lurked in your heart but never seemed practical right now. Maybe the frontier is being the first person in your family to really take following Jesus seriously. That's a pioneering kind of thing to do. Whatever it is, it is likely not going to be that well-beaten path that most of humanity runs. This is about figuring out God's calling, the, the, the place where Jesus, our pioneer, is leading us. And here's the thing about it. Wherever he leads us, it will require faith. If you're looking ahead at the race marked out for you and you're like, I've totally got it. All downhill, I'm pretty much coasting. Probably not the race of the pioneer Jesus marked out for you. Because what you find is that over and over again, the race marked out for you, that path of the pioneer, requires faith. That's the point of Hebrews chapter 11. All these heroes of the old covenant, they had to have faith in God. And so with us too, as the pioneer leads us, okay, we're gonna have to trust God every step of the way. I think about our church back when September 11th happened in 2001. And some of you were around at that point, 17, 18 years ago. And you remember that after those events happened, we opened up the doors, we prayed as a church, and we sent a team from Grace up to New York City, and we tried to serve the first responders up there and to pray with the people of New York who had suffered so profoundly in those attacks. But you also might remember the climate of our country at that time. There was this justified outrage at the meaningless death of innocent people and the burning of such powerful American symbols like the World Trade Center. And that outrage, even in many churches, began to creep toward an anti-Islamic perspective, an Islamophobia directed against extremists and maybe just anybody who called himself or herself Muslim. And so when Buddy and the team came back and shared that it felt like God was calling us as a church to reject Islamophobia and actually move toward Muslim communities in love and in service, it was not a super popular direction to go. A lot of people said, you want me to love who? You want me to serve who? And I even remember when I came on staff at Grace just a couple of years later, this journey, this direction was already underway and it felt like a pioneering path. And, and I remember coming and the first thing that I did when I was on staff as an intern was join our team of college students going over to London to work with Muslim communities there. And we've told these stories before, but as we we're trying to share Jesus, we got a couple of our guys beat up physically for talking about Jesus and for disrespecting the honorable stuff of some of the Muslims that we had met. And so I was kind of feeling a little bit dicey about that. And a couple of months after I got home from London, Buddy came over and he said, hey, we're gonna take a trip to Lebanon. You wanna come? And there was something about Lebanon that lodged in my heart and triggered this pretty fearful Mindset. You know, I was a history major in college, so I, I knew about the civil war that had raged in Lebanon, and I knew those news stories of places getting blown up in Lebanon, and that was the first time that for me, I realized, whoa, if that's the race marked out for me, going to Lebanon, that's a little scary. 
I remember thinking, okay, Lord, am I willing to die in Lebanon? The race marked out for us requires faith. Of course, when I got to Lebanon, it was not what I expected at all. It was amazing. People were super welcoming. It was wonderful. So enjoyed it. Beautiful country. Only one car bomb went off close by, and everybody was fine. Um. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just reflecting on this sort of nervous laughter. Everybody's like, can we, can we laugh at that? Is what... But that kind of leads us toward that idea, the path of a pioneer, right? Because the perspective of a pioneer, where's my frontier? Lord, where are you leading me? And wherever he leads us, whether it's exotic or it's every day, it's going to require some faith. We're going to have to trust Jesus, the pioneer. Uh, But as we walk this path, we need to consider the cost and the gain in following Jesus on these pioneering routes. So in our passage Jesus knew that there was a cross involved in his pioneering work to establish the faith. It says that he endured the cross and despised its shame. But we cannot disqualify the cost of being a pioneer for Jesus here. Being a pioneer is very costly. You're disrupting the status quo. You're disturbing the institutions of evil. And so when Jesus went to the cross, that cost played out very practically in his reputation. You know, as he's going to the cross, people are assuming that he is a criminal. It cost physical possessions. It cost relationships. It costs physical pain and, of course, ultimately death. And there's this phrase among military folks and law enforcement personnel that the first guy through the door gets bloody. Pioneering is costly. Jesus shows us that perhaps more clearly than anybody else. And for us as a church, I think we have seen that pioneering to engage the Muslim community. It has been costly. People have pushed back. People have left the church. They say, we don't want to deal with that whole thing. I'm not comfortable with that. They stick in their heels. Planting churches in new communities has been costly, very costly, especially out of this church here at Snellville that you guys have been so generous to help launch so many leaders and resources to start new churches. And we try to plant these churches where we see Jesus leading us. And often Jesus is leading us into neighborhoods that may not be the most financially viable. We're doing, we're not doing economic studies going, you know what, if we start a church here, we're going to make a bunch of money. Not at all. The Lord's leading us And we're following, and it's been costly every single time. The way we do student ministry, LUG, if you're involved with LUG on Wednesday nights during the school year, you know that we have our high schoolers as LUG heads leading groups of our middle schoolers. And they're overseen by adults. But when we first started talking about empowering high school students to disciple middle schoolers, people pushed back like crazy. They were probably the parents of teens. You want my high schooler to disciple someone? But you should have seen the feedback and the pushback. People say, no, that, that is trusting these students with too much. That pioneering path cannot be right. That requires a lot of faith in these high schoolers. But it's where the pioneer, Jesus, was leading us. And what we've seen since is the fruit time and again of seeing those students empowered to lead and investing in the next generation. And it's messy and it's costly, but that's also where we see the gain. And here, Jesus, it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. So for Jesus, there was cost, incredible cost, but for joy, he endured that cost. And what we see here is that the primary discovery of the pioneer is joy. The joy on the other side, the joy of new relationships. 
the joy of new impact, the joy of new life, the joy of new authority, the joy of new reward. And so yes, lots of pioneering ventures around grace have been very costly. But when I think about the conversations I've had with some of you saying, I never thought I would get to know refugees like this. And now I can't imagine my life without these relationships. Or when I talk to you and say, I, you know what? I never thought I'd be volunteering, teaching the Bible to fourth graders in a cafeteria at a good news club after school. But now that I'm doing it, it's so rewarding. And the conversations of people who've come to faith, the people who've been blessed, if you've been a part of our work with the foster care community, whether you've fostered children or you've supported a foster family, you know that the cost is unimaginably high. And yet the gain to be found in joining Jesus the pioneer in the rescue of kids in crisis is almost unspeakable. And so the path of a pioneer is extremely costly but the gain is incalculable. And so, what's our posture? What's the posture of a pioneer? And even though it's exciting to tell stories about great pioneers and, and to hear a message about pioneering, still there's some of us here that can be really challenged by this because new frontiers are new frontiers and we don't know what's out there. And, and maybe you're young and full of energy and full of potential, but you just can't figure out, where do I go? What do I do? I'm excited about everything. What's, where is my race marked out? I want to run. I'm running. I've got full of energy, but I don't know where the race is marked out. Or, or maybe you're at a different stage of life where you are married and you've got children and you've got a mortgage. It's not the best time to hop in a canoe and start exploring, you know? Hopping in a canoe at this point would be more escapism than exploration. <laughs> or, or maybe you're in another stage of life where you've had your adventures, you've put in your time, you've done your service, and you're ready to just sort of settle down. And so the reminder that Jesus is a pioneer pressing forward into new territory is a little bit unsettling. And here's what I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you, everybody in this room, you've got to move to Tajikistan tomorrow. Remember, you gotta run your race. That's what the scripture says. Run the race marked out for us. But what I am telling you is that every race requires faith. And sometimes running that race is like running on a straight road and you can see pretty far down there. And so running is just staying consistent. Other times the race marked out for us is twisty and turny and it's up and down. You can barely see more than three feet in front of you. And if you don't watch the ground right in front of you, you will trip and fall because it is intense and complicated. But regardless, Jesus, if we're following him, will be leading us into new places that require new faith. And so our posture, our posture really matters. And I've got my baseball glove up here for this illustration. A lot of you guys know that I was a pitcher through college. I also played a good amount of third base. And playing third base, and they call it the hot corner because you are pretty close to most right-handed hitters who pull the ball. And so they call it the hot corner because you get a lot of hot ground balls in your general direction. You don't have a whole lot of time to react. And, and so playing third base can actually be a little bit of an intimidating position. And you, um, you know, when I, when I graduated from college and then played a little bit of softball, playing third base is even scarier because now the ball is just looping in and guys are cranking it at you, you know? And it's very easy to be afraid of the baseball especially playing third base. And kind of the only way to get over that fear I've found is to take a few baseballs in, in, in your body, you know? Like, <laughs> gotta get whacked a few times. And uh, actually, part of how I learned this lesson is I took one right here on this tooth, which is fake, by the way. But once you survive a few baseballs hitting you, you realize, okay, we can hang in there for this. But if you go to a Braves game, you go to any live baseball game, you should watch the infielders before every pitch. And what you will find is that as the pitcher is delivering to the batter, all those infielders are taking a step in 
and rocking forward onto their toes like that. And especially at third base, it doesn't seem intuitive. It doesn't seem like the natural sort of thing to do. You're sitting there waiting for a guy to hit a ball at you very fast that might hit you, and yet they coach you, take a step in, get on the balls of your feet. Our natural inclination is to kind of rock back, like, whoa, look out, I don't want to get hit. But the right thing to do is get forward like this because it comes fast. And unless you're ready and leaning forward, you're toast. That's the posture of a pioneer. Moving forward on the balls of your feet, not afraid. Leaning back on your heels, that's the posture of fear. Leaning in, that is the posture of faith. And I want you to actually feel this physically in your body. So go ahead and stand up right where you are. And I know you don't have enough space to do a full lean into the pitch, but I just want you to feel on your feet, rock back on your heels. And when you're back on your heels, if somebody jostled you, you would stumble and maybe fall over. But now lean forward onto the balls of your feet and just bend your knees a little bit and feel that moving forward. This is what Jesus calls us to. This is Jesus the pioneer saying, learn to step in and lean in to what life brings. And life comes at you fast. And sometimes life hits you in the mouth and it's very painful. But keep leaning in. This is our posture. And this morning, We have communion, but it's set up a little bit differently than usual. Rather than serving it to you where you are, we're going to invite you here in a few moments, halfway through the next song, to come to the stations. We've got four stations up here at the front. We've got stations around the sides and in the back. And I want you to have this sense that you are moving toward Jesus, the pioneer. And when you receive that communion, you are receiving forgiveness for sins, the bread like his broken body, the cup like his blood poured out. But you're also remembering, I want you to remember taking this communion, that Jesus in coming, dying and rising again was pioneering for us. And so taking this communion is receiving Jesus' invitation, not only for forgiveness, but his invitation to lean in to pioneer, to follow that great pioneer forward. Because we are pioneers. Following Jesus, the great pioneer.